All right. Good morning again. If you came in a little bit late and you're new with us here today, on behalf of the Promise family, we just want to extend a special welcome to you. If you would do us a favor and stop by the lobby after the service today, that would mean the world to us. You'd be receiving a free gift today. Um, and also, we would like to see if you would love, we would love it if you would give us your email so you can keep you um, connected on everything that's going on around here. Okay? If I haven't met you yet, my name is Pastor Reno, and I have the privilege and honor of serving this little flock that I'm very proud of that does amazing things for the kingdom. At this time, I just want to recognize one of our faithful sisters who will no longer be attending Promise Church because she's re relocating smarter to South Carolina. Her name is Kristen Cuddle. I have seen only God moments in and through, front row, many of us, in the, her life. I have seen this church be Jesus, the hands and feet of Jesus to her intimately. I've seen her sit under the proclamation of the word and the power of the gospel. And I've seen her grow. I've seen her flourish. And I've seen her put some old demons to death in her own life. And it's all because of God's grace resting on this little church. Kristen, we love you and we will miss you. As they said, and we cannot emphasize it enough, there's a few roles that still need to be filled for Family Fun Day for it to be a success next week. If you feel like the Holy Spirit tapped you on the shoulder and you haven't signed up to serve next Saturday, we can use some little, a little bit of extra help in a couple of areas. I'll be out in the lobby after the service. I'll be standing by the sign-up sheets, and I can help you from there, okay? Let's pray. Rain things back in for a second. Father, please... Wrote it to our hearts to receive your word this morning, Lord. Lord, we are a distracted people. And Father, I pray that you would please, by your power, by your Holy Spirit, help us to hit that proverbial pause button on everything that's going on in our life and to give you our attention as your word proclaims itself to be informational, inspirational, motivational, and transformational. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. It was a spring day in 1992, and it started off to be a beautiful Saturday morning. And it was a special day because I had another date with a beautiful Italian girl named Sarah, who five and a half years later would become my wife. I knew that it was a special date because if I didn't keep myself together, I might lose the opportunity of getting more dates. So I made sure that I detailed the car, made sure there was no French fries hiding anywhere. I took a real close shave, took a shower, and I went into my closet. I found that silk shirt from Merry-Go-Round, those brand new Z Cavaricis, and my brand new Zodiac shoes, and I was on my way to her house. After a spray of Jakar, of course. <laughs> you remember Jakar? All right. As I was driving to her house, I was filled with excitement and joy. As I pulled into Sarah's driveway, I tried to convince myself that what I saw on the right side of her driveway was not true. I got out of the car and I saw her father was laying in the grass. And I noticed that his color was off and that his hands were shut tightly. I again tried to convince myself, this is not happening. I tried to give him CPR and it didn't work. And then it dawned on me, we need to call 911. And I knocked on the door and I said, call 911 right now. Look, her father was laying in the grass. After it would seem like an eternity and a lot of prayer, the ambulance sitting outside in front of her house would felt like forever, but it was only about a half hour. They decided to take him to the hospital and see if they can do more there. And her father passed. When her father passed, my mother-in-law was only 48 years old. He was only 50, leaving my wife at 19 years old and her brother at 21. A few weeks later, the time 
came to get his clothes out of the dresser drawers. And my mother-in-law and my wife found something that was very important. It was the one thing that could have saved his life and perhaps he would have still been with us here today. What was that that they found, you ask? Full bottles of blood thinners. Not one pill taken. He refused to take the one thing that could have saved his life. His stubborn Sicilian Italian heart and pride rejected what he knew he needed to partake of. And that leads us to today's passage. We will consider the fact that God is a God of justice and mercy, but he fully discloses what we need, and many of us reject it. Jesus brings full disclosure and full warnings to those who do not receive him and repent and decide to reject him as their personal savior. The heat is about to get turned up in Matthew. And I want you to know that because this sermon might make you feel a little uncomfortable. And I love you enough to tell you that in advance. A little review from last week to set things up. And I'm going to ask a question and you're going to get a gift today if you know the answer to this question. Okay? So Jesus was dealing with doubters that were representing John the Baptist. And they came to ask him, are you the one or should we expect someone else? And we said, based on Jesus' response, the good old words of C.S. Lewis, if God, then miracles, right? Now, don't put it up yet. Who remembers the name of last week's sermon? I got a real special gift for you, if you remember. It's three words. Who said that? When in doubt, I got a zucchini for you from my garden. <laughs> Good job, Janet. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. If you want to know how to make stuffed zucchini, call Sarah. It's excellent. It's not a lot of prep. It won't take forever, but it'll make Joel smile for months. This is what we learned in the first 11 verses, chapter 19 last week. I'm sorry, 19 verses of chapter 11. We said, when in doubt, wrestle. Ask the tough questions. Do you remember that? God can handle your wrestling. We said reflect. Reflect on the scripture and the promises of God that were fulfilled. And don't forget them when in doubt. When in doubt, remember. Remember what? Remember all the miraculous things that God has done in your life when you don't feel like remembering it. We said when in doubt, release. Release what? Who remembers? I don't have any more zucchini, but I'll give you a rain check. Release what? Expectations. Good job, Bina. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Expectation plus reality equals... Kevin, give it to me. Expectation plus reality equals disappointment. So we said release the expectations. John sent his disciples and they expected the wrong Messiah. And they needed to release that. Then we learned in 11, 11 through 19 that we are to remain we are to remain. So even when you're in doubt, even when all this self-talk is coming, even when you don't have the ability to think about things that are true, true and pure and noble and pure and lovely and honorable and excellent, worthy of praise, Jesus says, remain, remain. Just stay there. Be still and know. It's coming. It might not come now, but it'll come. And that's what happens when in doubt. So it's important to note that up to this point in the book of Matthew, Jesus has been very careful not to stir things up before their time, because he had work to do. His teachings, his miracles, and the proof that he was the one and only son of God had to happen before the heat was turned up, because if it was turned up too much, they were going to stop him, arrest him, and end it, which they did, but it had a purpose, but timing was everything. So from this point in chapter 11 and forward, Jesus doesn't hold back anymore. And one scholar said that you can literally draw a line right before verse 20. And now the book of Matthew is divided into two sections. The first section is where Jesus does maybe just cast some shadows here and there to bring a little bit of resistance. But now he's going to turn it up because the time has come and a good Savior discloses everything so that 
we do not get whiplash. If you would pick up your Bibles, and if you need one, raise your hand, because it will not be on the screen. Promise Church is a church that loves to hold the precious pages in their hands. And if you can do that and not go to your phone, you'll thank me later when the five people that texted you and emailed you um, were waiting until after the service. So raise your hand if you need a Bible. We'll get you one. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 11. No one's raising their hand, so that means I'm a proud pastor because everyone here has a Bible in their hand. Matthew 11, 20 through 27. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. But sorrow awaits for you, Korazin, and Bethsaida. For if the miracles I did in you were done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their head to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you, people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles I did for you had been done in the wicked Sodom, it would have still been there today. I'm sorry, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father. No one truly knows the Father except the Son and to those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Matthew 11, 20 through 27. Let's dig into this. Take a look at verse 20 in your Bibles, please. You see that first word there is, Jesus began to denounce. Other versions say rebuke. This is a word that Christian people like to throw around. Sometimes we rebuke the mosquitoes, right? It's a loaded word, and it deserves a little bit of attention. This word denounce or rebuke brings an idea of disgrace, insult, because of mockery, casting blame because of, follow me now, created shame. Shame that you brought upon yourself. It carries the sense of viewing someone as guilty and therefore deserving a punishment. Denounce. Duke. These people were denounced because of their incorrect expectations. The rejection of the call to repent and accept Jesus after everything that he has done to prove that he is truly the Son of God. Therefore, Jesus' actions and reactions now are to denounce and warn them of a heart of concern as well as a heart of righteous anger. Jesus wants people to repent. You need to grab your, your arms and, and hug that thought. Hold it close. He wants people to repent. You're going to need that thought for the end of this teaching because you might have some uh, self-talk at the end. Now, why would Jesus express this sorrow and anger? Take a look at this verse on the screen. It says that God in his kindness is patient. Why? Because he does not want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everyone to repent. Other versions say he's not willing that any should perish, but all shall come to repentance. A quick reminder, the word repent, if you remember, we've mentioned this word quite a few times here, I promise, but if you weren't with us, I want to give you no FOMO and no whiplash on this. Repentance is godly sorrow for your sin with a daily desire not to repeat the same sin. This is what it looks like on the screen. So you know that Uno card that says reverse, reverse. That's what happens when you repent. There's a difference between knowing that you need to reverse and just knowing it and not doing anything about it, like the pills in my father-in-law's drawer. 
and repenting. This is a change of mind and action, thinking, behavior, and desires. And Jesus now is angered by their rejection out of a heart of concern, just like my in-laws were when my father-in-law rejected to take those blood thinners. And this leads us to our first point. Write it down, note takers. Number one, consequences for nothing. Now let me explain to you what we mean by that. To do nothing with the message of salvation has consequences. To do nothing with those pill bottles has consequences. Let's go to verse 21 and 22, and you're going to notice that Jesus begins to reveal the consequences to those who reject him as a revealed Messiah and the Savior of the world. Take a look at this word uh, for sorrow in verse 21. It has to do with coming judgment. What sorrow awaits you? Do you see that in verse 21? The original Greek translates that this word is actually a Hebrew word, and it's the word woe. And this is not like woe horsey, okay? He says, woe to you, Korazin. This word woe, pronounced oi, maybe that's where the Mexicans get that, I don't know. Um, it's an expression of grief, criticism, and condemnation. So what is the judgment that will come? Something that preachers don't like to talk about, but it's the most thing that Jesus ever talked about. Hell. The judgment to come is hell. Hell is a place where there is continual weeping and grinding of teeth and eternal fire and separation from God. Now, I was studying this and an interesting stat came my way. Do you know that only 58% of people around the globe believe that there is a hell? But if you were to ask the same people if there's a heaven, over 70% of them believe that heaven and angels exist. But only 58% believe that hell exists. Why? It's because I don't think that people think of God as a God of justice. You know, they think he's like Santa Claus. Like, even if I'm on a naughty list, I'll get my, I'll get my gifts, right? God is not like that. Because God is perfect in every way, he makes wrong things right. That's what justice is. Making wrong things right. Now, we're going to peel some onion layers back. And we're going to get into this. Let's start with these towns that Jesus mentions. You take a look in your Bible, you see Chorazin and Basaira. These are very close to Jesus' headquarters, which we said was where? Who remembers? Capernaum. Good job. Now Tyre and Sidon are port towns that drew all kinds of inappropriate activities into this port. If you're in the Navy, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus is telling his hearers that these towns would have never missed him. The Messiah and everything that he proved to be Messiah, these people would, would have done something about this. There wouldn't have been consequences for nothing, right? But the people in these towns, they were all around where Jesus revealed himself very crystal clear. They did nothing. And now... There will be, say it with me on a count of three, one, two, three. Yes. Promise church, we can learn from this. We live in a toxic, tension, dark world today. You don't believe me, all you got to do is watch the Olympics. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Our God will not be mocked. He will not. And those people will have a very, very, very bad day. But our job is to preach the gospel to people who just don't know. So don't get mad at them. Pray for them. And pray that they find Jesus like a Mack truck. That's what we need to do. At 75 miles an hour, head-on collision. Now, one scholar pointed something out to me. He said this, quote, You see, when Jesus reveals himself to you in an unmistakable way, that being miracles, calling you to himself by the gospel message and revealing his presence, you can't miss the light of the world when it's really dark all around you. 
This is what the scholar said. Greater light, greater responsibility. One of my mentors, his name is Gary Wall. I miss him very much. He moved out of state. I've known him for 20 years and he moved. 18 years. I've known him 20 years. Two years ago. He was telling me about this trip that he went on in these caverns. Now, Italians don't know what a cavern is, but you know what a cave is. Okay? Um, and many of us, we don't know what a cavern is. Some of you guys do. It's a cave. Okay? And he said that he went on this trip to Tennessee, and there was a man who was their tour guide and took him way in the back of this cave, and they shut off all of their flashlights for about five to seven minutes. You know what I'm talking about, right? And when they shut the, the, the flashlights off for after five to seven minutes, he told them, wave your hand in front of your eyes. Can you see it? And every single one of them said no until one single element changed everything in the darkness. And you want to know what it was? Not a flashlight. Here it is on the screen. One match. The man lit one match, and 30 people that were on this tour were able to see the depth of that cave. The dark cities of Tyre and Sidon would have never missed the light because it was very dark there. Capernaum, Chorazin, Basaira, it wasn't too dark in their own mind, even though it was. They thought things were going good. They had a temple, they had all these Jewish religious leaders and preachers, and things were going pretty decent, except for the ruthless Roman government. We can learn from this here. Promise Church, listen to me now. I believe that we need to stop as Christians punking and talking trash about this wonderful nation called the great country of the United States of America. And I'm not running for office, so relax. Listen to me. This land is God's land. This land was planted by people who said, in God we trust. This land brought Judeo-Christian principles that sacrificed the lives of many so that this country can be even what it still is today. Stop talking trash about this country. Taxes that are high suck. I get it. Okay? We all do. But big God, small problems. Small God, big problems. He can supply everything you need even to pay those high taxes. Our job? Greater darkness greater light. We need to be the greater light. Satan's got us confused. We've got to stop. We've got to reach for that matchbook. And we've got to stand with that one match in the dark caves of America today. Because this country can change not by politics, not by who becomes the next president, but by the name that is above every name that one day every knee will bow and tongue confess, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You follow me? Look at verse 23. Keep in mind that Capernaum was the place where Jesus did many of his miracles, more than anywhere else. It's the place where demons were cast out, where the blind and the deaf were healed. It's the place where synagogue leader's daughter was brought back to life. It's the place where Peter's mother-in-law was healed of a fever instantly. It's the place where the women that was bleeding for 12 years was healed. Capernaum was the place where the centurion's servant was healed. And don't forget about that paralytic that was dropped through the roof that they, that they ripped off and scholars say it was probably Peter's house. All this to say this. Capernaum was miracle central. God came down from heaven in the person of Jesus Christ to prove that Emmanuel was here, God with us. He revealed himself through the never seen or heard of before miracles performed in Capernaum and these little towns around it. And these people did nothing. They did nothing with these miracles. They did nothing with the message. They did not repent. They refused to accept Jesus' message and therefore they will receive, say it with me, Look at verse 24. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you. Sodom and Gomorrah was a place where very inappropriate, lustful, sexual behavior was performed. It was disgusting. 
It was typical for there to be orgies, even within families with incest. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that thought. It was despised by God. And because he knows how to make wrong things right, it was destroyed. With raining sulfur from heaven, burned. This is like New Orleans and Las Vegas today. However, because of God's great mercy and because of his promises, he saved his seed. And a man named Lot and his two daughters were rescued from the destruction. And Lot's wife, and I wonder why she looked back, right? She looked back. And the angel said, don't look back. Let's go. We're going. We're out of here. Rescue mission. She got tempted to look back. I wonder if she was thinking about one of her own hookups, right? So one of her old pleasures. Look back. God turned her into a pillar of salt. This is found in Genesis chapter 19. Now yet, in verse 24 of Matthew, Jesus says it will be worse for Capernaum than Sodom and Gomorrah. How much worse can it be than sulfur and fire raining down from heaven and being completely destroyed and wiping these places off the map? And there's even archaeological and even tours of this place to prove that this happened. If you don't believe the Bible's real sometimes, it is. Look at this. Take a look at this, what an old Bible commentator says. And this is basically a summary of the whole section that we are preaching today here at Promise Church. Ready? Quote, The Lord exercises his mighty, almighty power, yet he punishes none more than they deserve and never withholds the knowledge of the truth from those who long after it. End of quote. Now take a look at verses 25 and 26. This leads us to our next point. Wise and clever versus childlike. Just two different distinct people here. Jesus is going to show you what it looks like to be wise and clever versus the childlike. So he suddenly begins to pray to his father. You see that? Verse 25, at that time Jesus prayed this prayer. O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. Okay? So he says, thank you for hiding these things. This is where you're going to want to listen. Jesus is a savior of revelation. What are these things that he revealed? Not just to them, but to us. He revealed the kingdom of heaven. He revealed repentance. He revealed faith. He revealed humility. And he revealed consequences. But he revealed countercultural living and the rescue plan for all of mankind and the way to eternal life in Christ Jesus. God revealed things in Jesus Christ so that your marriage can change. God revealed things in Jesus Christ so that that one person that you've been saved, praying for that would be saved would be saved. God revealed things in Jesus Christ so that we can know that heaven has touched earth and that we are never to lose the hope of heaven. Ever. Now notice the two kinds of people. The wise and the clever and the childlike. The wise and the clever are those who are wise and clever in their own eyes. These are the highly intellectual teachers of the law who think they know it all. They're wise in their own eyes, but they're too stubborn to repent and accept the gospel. Today, these would be the people with all kinds of letters after their name. And there's a lot of very smart people, of course, that have professed faith in Jesus Christ. But I will tell you, the higher percentage is those who think they know it all, and it becomes a barrier for them to receive Christ in faith. And God has revealed Christ. To who? To who? Very good. Say it again. The childlike. Good. Now, who's the childlike? Well, the childlike are those who receive his message by faith and trust. And they trust him like a child who was brought by their dad out to the field that said, this kite is going to fly. And the kid was like, it is? Well, he's my dad. I'm going to believe him. I mean, it's not flying. And the dad takes the package off the kite 
He says, son or daughter, I want you to stand here with this string. And he unravels it. He throws the kite up in the fly. And the kid says, I knew it would fly, daddy. I knew it would. That's childlike faith. You got me? I lost my place. (laughs) There it is. The other reason why Jesus says to have childlike faith is because remember we said that you need to be born again. And if you're going to have a second birth, you'll be childlike. And that means you need to be born again from heaven. Jesus said this in John chapter 3. It's not something that weird Christian people call themselves. It's people think. um, People in the very traditional religious ways of growing up, they're like the born-againers. Stay away from them. They're, oh, you're a born-again guy? No, 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 I'm not doing that, you know? No, we're born again because we've been born from God, the Holy Spirit, who opened our eyes to see we need to be born from above. And your mother's birth cannot offer you eternal life. And I wonder if someone here today needed to hear that for the first time. Now let's take a look at verse 27. I'm going to read it because, man, is this loaded. We're going to land the airplane. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father. And no one truly knows the Father except the Son. And to those to whom the Son chooses, reveal him. Takes us to our last point. Like Father, like Son. Like Father, like Son. Notice the first statement that Jesus makes here when he says, my father has entrusted everything to me. You see, you see that there? My father has entrusted everything to me. Look down, you'll see that in your Bible. He wants his hearers to know, I didn't come here on my own accord. I came here on a mission from my father in heaven. Jesus also does not call God by his proper name here, Yahweh. He says, my father. In the Jewish culture, the father, man, meant a lot. These fathers took their role very, very seriously. When that word father, Abba, was mentioned, there was warm hearts, right? A lot of us can relate. A lot of us have had some great fathers, right? Or spiritual fathers. So the father being that spiritual leader that's important There's a public, personal, intimate display of affection between Jesus and his father here. Now notice, Jesus doesn't say some things. What does he say there? Somebody give it to me so I make sure you're still with me. Everything. Very good. One person's with me. Amen. (laughs) What is everything? Think about this for a minute. This is loaded. This is deep. We really need to pay attention here. What is everything that Jesus has been entrusted with? God has entrusted his son, God in the flesh, with everything. What is it? The ability to save you from your sins. The ability to redeem you, to buy you back from that death program that entered all the world at the fall of humanity when sin entered. The knowledge of evil came before there was. Everything is the rescue mission that Jesus has for your life even now. Everything is to make final covering known as atonement for mine and your sin. Maybe you don't know that. Maybe you're not a Christian. You don't know that. That's what God entrusted to Jesus. And it happened on the cross. Everything is to give this new covenant called the kingdom of heaven that has come to earth when Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everything is to take care of us physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, and mentally. That's everything that Jesus is entrusted with. Jesus wants to know if you will become like a child and receive him with childlike faith today. Anybody need that for the first time today? Let me know. Do you need that? Do you for the first time need to say, I, man, I've heard this. They've been talking about Jesus becoming my savior. But this is making sense now. Because without it, we will be judged. 
We will be going to that place where he said earlier called Hades or hell, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, eternal torment and separation from God. But Jesus loves you enough to say, while it is still day, while it is the day of salvation, will you come to him in childlike faith? Will you? That's the question. If you come to childlike faith after this sermon, please let us know. It starts with faith. But there's more. A lot more. And you've got to start somewhere. But it starts by putting your faith in who Jesus is. And I know that's confusing. But it's got to start somewhere. And the confusion, I promise you, will go away as long as you stay connected. And if not this church, a church that preaches the gospel and the word of God and the message about Jesus very clearly. Let us know. Our email is info at hispromisechurch.org. If you want to let me know right away, I got a brand new Bible I'd love to give you. It's called the New Believer's Bible. Say, Reno, I came to Jesus in childlike faith today. I did. I was too afraid to raise my hand because I'm still dealing with pride. It's okay. You're in good company here. But pride is the one thing that will clog that pipe from heaven to earth. So get that rotary root out and shove it right into the pride. Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now what do we see? What else do we see? Let's get back into this. Jesus wants them to know that he rep represents God Almighty, and he is Emmanuel. Next, notice that Jesus says that no one knows the Father like him. Jesus is also letting us know that he has this very special relationship with God. It's exclusive. Nobody on earth has a relationship like Jesus and his father and his father and Jesus. Nobody. Period. Mic drop. The father and the son are clear on all things about one another. The father has always been clear. From the time of Genesis all the way through Malachi, the Italian prophet. I'm sorry, Malachi. Like father, like son. So now he's starting to intensify his message by saying that he and the Father are one. He knows that pushback is going to come now because of these statements. And the Jews hearing this would have been offended by this because they think this is an arrogant man claiming some kind of deity. Deity, a word we don't use every day, but an important word. And if our job is to teach you the Bible, you're going to learn what deity means. Very easy. Deity equals divine nature. What does divine mean? From God. Nature from God. Jesus got his deity straight from God. Close your eyes and listen to this, please. Listen to this. In the beginning was the Word, and it already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, Jesus, existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created and was brought to light to be the life of light to everyone. The light shines into the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus came to the world that he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people and they rejected him, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Open your eyes. Anybody in here still childlike? Raise your hand. It should be all of us. You're a child of God. That's why we sang that song today. And then he goes on to say they are reborn, not of a physical birth, resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Now, remember, Jesus was born of a virgin conceived of the Holy Spirit. So what can we learn from this now? If you want to know who God is, then you got to get to know who Jesus is. Plain and simple. You say, God, you never, you never talk to me. You never, it's not like I could sit like my husband or wife or my kids. Or, you want to know God? Start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for two years straight and don't read anything else. Keep going. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. For two years straight, come and tell me what happens. You'll get to know God you'll get to know Jesus. So if you want to get to know Jesus, get to know God. But if you want to know God, who do you got to get to know? 
Very good. You're paying attention. Jesus and the kingdom of God have been revealed from heaven. There's no excuse for people to deny who God is. He came down to earth to reveal who he is. And his perfect son, Jesus Christ. Now I want you to turn to your Bibles. This is very important to me and I want you to know how to find this in a lickety split. Colossians chapter 1. If you need your table of contents, use it and put the pride on the shelf. Colossians chapter 1. You are going to need this for the rest of your life every single day because if you forget who Jesus is, your Christian walk will be watered down in everything that you do. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. We're almost done. Hang in there. I'm going to go a little bit over because of uh, the missions thing that we did. So five more minutes. You guys okay with that? Okay. Otherwise, I'll end right now and we'll just pick it up next week. No one's going to get mad at me, right? Okay. Amen. Say that again. It's the Lord's Day. That's right. Portillo's can wait. All right. Ready? Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. You're going to want to underline visible and invisible. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He, Jesus, made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in this unseen world. You know what he means by that? You ever had breakfast with the queen? Gone now, but before she was gone? We knew she existed. You know why? Think about it. Look at the words there. All those authorities of the unseen world, we've never seen the queen. We see her on TV. I never sat down with her. That authority was given to her by Christ. Let's move on. Everything that was created through him was for him. Everything existed before anything else. I'm sorry, he existed before anything else. And he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Here it is. Underline this right here. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Deity. Christ is claiming deity right now to all these people listening because God decided to empty the fullness of himself in his son. Do not miss that. Let's move on. Like Father, like Son, all of God's character, deity, and fullness was emptied into Jesus. And he revealed himself to mankind so that we can know God. So if you want to get to know the Son, get to know the Father. And if you want to get to know the Father, get to know the Son. I said it a couple times, but we forget. We forget. Jesus doesn't just keep things to himself. So there's a lot for us to learn right now. And these are the takeaways if you want to write them down. Number one, he reveals it. Number two, because of that, we don't conceal the gospel message. We got to get out there and reveal it. Take a look at the six behind us. Everybody turn around. You see that there? There's a reason why we put it there. It's not because we have some pretty orange and black and white colors. You see what number four says? On the count of three, we're going to read it real loud. And you're going to let people know that Promise Church is fired up about this. One, two, three. Tell others about Jesus. Amen. This is a message that is worth revealing, not concealing. We proclaim the kingdom. This goes back to the Father's gracious will. Look at this in verse 26 in your Bible. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. Now go back to verse 27b, the most loaded verse in all of the book of Matthew. This verse throws a lot of questions in our face. And I hope I can help you with this right now, the best I possibly can as a mere man. Lord, may the meditations of my heart and the words of my lips be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Here's the sticky part of the sermon. To those to whom the Son chooses 
feel him. If we would only have this scripture and no other to go along with it, there'd be a sense of, in your mind that you would think that, okay, so Jesus does eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Is that what he does? Saved, go to hell, saved, go to hell, saved, go to hell. Is that what Jesus does? A lot of people, you don't know that, that he doesn't do that. Look at this word for choose and listen to me because this is very, very important. It's not like choosing the kids on your kickball team in a cul-de-sac in Addison, put them on the drive. Or in your old neighborhood. This word choose translates to plan with full resolve and determination. Write that down. So now I'm going to reread it. The Father only truly knows the Father, I'm sorry, no one truly knows the Father except the Son and to those to whom the Son plans with full resolve and determination to reveal Him. It's not to choose in the American word that you think. I'll choose this, not that. This word means that Jesus had full determination to resolve what sin did to the whole world. Jesus revealed the, the kingdom of God and he called people to repent because he wills for everyone to never be punished or condemned. That is his will. Therefore, he chooses and reveals with a full resolve and determination. Now, look down in your Bible again. It says there's certain people here, right? The son chooses to reveal him. These are certain people. Who are the certain people? These are the ones who do accept it. These are the ones who do something, not nothing, after they are revealed this great message. Not the pompous know-it-alls who think they know it all, but they really don't know anything at all. Remember that they're only wise in their own eyes, as Jesus just said. Remember, Jesus desires for everyone to repent. Why do you think they walked around for three and a half years saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? He desires for everyone to be saved. Everyone. He doesn't pick and choose who he's going to reveal himself to. Again, that word choose, and you might want to write it down, means to plan with full resolve and determination. What Jesus is saying here is this. Even though Jesus has been revealed to all the earth, He's only truly revealed to those who accept him. The word reveal here is another word. It means to uncover or bring to light. I can do this all I want. And I tell you, there's a Bible under here. I pull this away. If you choose not to believe there's a Bible here, I did my part. What kind of revelation would it be to say, no, that's not a Bible? to uncover or to bring to light. Revelation of the good news about Jesus is good news, but it's not only good news after it's truly accepted, it's good news when it's entirely accepted and you do something with it and there's this uncontrolled response to what has been revealed because of your belief, your faith, and your trust. So now you repent because of your sorrow. And that sorrow you realize is now godly sorrow because godly sorrow leads to repentance. Godly sorrow leads to the desire to no longer do the things that you know you ought to be doing and me to. Take a look at this just to seal the deal here. Mark 16, 15. It won't be on the screen, but I'm going to read it. Somebody told them, at the end of this, you can tell me who it was. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. To some? Do you know what it translates in the Greek? To all of the earth. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But everyone who refuses to believe it will be condemned. Who said that? Jesus. Before you think, when you read this verse 27, is oh, he's only choosing to reveal to some and not others? It takes a whole Bible to make a whole. 
It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. There's some really wacky theology out there that rests on God's sovereign grace. Is God sovereign and gracious? Yes. He is not willing that any should perish, but all shall come to repentance. Isaiah 1.16 says, God says, come let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, red like crimson. He says, come. He doesn't say stay away. He says, come and I will wash you as white as snow. He says, as far as the east is from the west, your transgressions are removed. He says that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He said that there is no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think God in his sovereign, gracious will wants the whole world to be saved. But he doesn't do like we do with our kids when they won't eat that peas because they're disgusting. I tasted them in the baby food and we just like jam it down their throat because we know it's good for them. They got to eat it and they spit it out, but you keep feeding it to them, right? What were we thinking as parents? They spit it out, it's all over their face and we get that little plastic spoon and like get it off and like put it back in, right? <laughs> That's not what God does. God gives you the choice because he doesn't program you like a bunch of robots and says, okay, I'm going to program you and say, saved, going to hell. Does he know who's going to save and go to hell? Yes, he is. It's like the ducky game at the carnival when every duck needs to be turned over to know what number's underneath because when they go around in the water and the big prize is number one, it's the big huge teddy bear that's like three feet tall and you can't even carry it, you will never know what that prize is until you go up to that ducky game and take the ducks and turn them over one by one. And keep playing until you find that number one. That's our job as Christians. Amen? Amen. Turn the ducks over, promise church. Turn them over. Because some of them are number one. And that number one equals people that are saved. And it makes me weep because I know we're becoming complacent in this. May this section of scripture shake you to your core and make you realize Judgment is coming. And God doesn't just force himself on people. He reveals things and he gives them no excuse. Romans chapter 1. He reveals it through creation. He reveals it through prophecy. He reveals it through his word. He reveals it to changing exhibit A right here who you were once lost but now you're found. Do you feel me? It's time to start telling others about Jesus. I'll calm down now. Two more sentences on the manuscript and we'll have a benediction. Revelation only has purpose when belief follows what has been revealed. Write that down. Revelation only has purpose when belief follows what has been revealed. You can't do nothing with this. This is where I can't do anymore. I was informational. I was inspirational. I was motivational. Now I pray that he will be transformed. Because if we do this, he can turn this world upside down. Jesus reveals both the good and the bad news because the bad news only makes the good news good. What word will we add to our word collage in our study called Matthew, who is he? Take a look at this on the screen. If you're a guest here, I want you to know we started with three words on our first week. And as we've been traveling through the book of Matthew, we've been adding words Grant had a great idea. He said, dude, we should make some t-shirts or put that on a wall one day. And I said, I think that's a great idea. People want to know who Jesus is. Today, we added justice and mercy because that's who Jesus is. He makes wrong things right, but at the same time, he doesn't give you what you do deserve. That's what mercy is. Not getting what you do deserve. Please stand for the benediction. I apologize in advance that we went over today. We had a jam-packed service. Before the benediction, I want to tell you, you walked in, not to leave those invitations on your seat. Please give us an easy cleanup job. Every single one of those invitations that are on those seats need to go. 
We're going to challenge you throughout the week to pray and ask somebody to come. Very non, very low-hanging fruit this Saturday to come. All your job is is to get them to come and have fun, family fun day. It's it. You're not even asking them to come to church. We'll take it from there on Saturday. Get those invitations. Pass them out. Promise kids will be lit for Jesus in this church on our clocks. And I want to see revival. And that shapes in the first 10 years of these kids' lives. When they turn 11, 12, 13, all the way to 18, we can pass the torch. We're going to have this event, and the purpose of it is to get young families to walk this property and see that church people are not weird. So pray about who you're going to invite. And let's have an awesome Saturday next week. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Benediction today is from Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 through 7. Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 through 7. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and the Lamb will be there. And his servants will worship him. And they will see him face to face. And his name will be forever written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there. And no need for any lamps or or sun. For the Lord God will shine on them. And they will reign forever. And the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what has happened soon. Look, there are red letters now, this is Jesus talking. I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey these words of prophecy written in this book. Promise Church, Thank you for joining us today. Guests, thank you for joining us today. You guys haven't noticed, we have the Velasquez family with us. They're visiting from Detroit. They got a new addition to their family. But now they got Xander and Zion. You little Zion there with Mama Bear, Cassie. Praise the Lord, huh? Why don't you guys stick around for some coffee, some refreshment after this, make a new friend, make somebody feel welcomed. Again, if you haven't signed up for Family Fun Day, I'll be out there after this. Sarah, make me a double espresso and bring it over there, please. (laughs) God bless you all, and we will see you Saturday. Have a great week.